For those of you who don't know me, my name is Elizabeth Lyon Hall, and I'm the executive director of Colas Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture. And our mission is to develop Catholic thought, culture, and community on Cornell campus through public lectures, non-credit courses, seminars, concerts, and cultural events. In our lecture series, we aim to make accessible the breadth and depth of the Catholic tradition by bringing to campus guest speakers in the arts, sciences, and theology. Today it is my privilege to introduce Father Pietro Narvat. Father Narvat has been working in Bolivia for more than 20 years and has dedicated his scholarly and artistic career to the popularization of missionary Baroque music from former Jesuit missionary churches. He is the organizer and artistic director of the Misiones de Chiquitos International Festival of American Renaissance and Baroque Music in Santa Cruz. And he is the recipient of many awards. I won't name them all. Some of them um, include the Queen Isabella Catholic Medal, the International Queen Sophia Award, the Officer's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland, and um, the Guggenheim Fel Fellowship. He is on the uh, theological faculty at the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland. Before we begin, I would like to thank the music department at Cornell and the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program for co-sponsoring this event. Also, a big thanks to Professor Isabel Ferreira um, for her work facilitating this. Now, please join me in welcoming Father Narvat for his talk on Baroque music from the Jesuit missions among the Chiquito and Moho ethnic groups. Thank you so much. And I admit, I'm a little bit uh, nervous uh, because uh, I arrived here yesterday, late at night, and obviously we know about Cornell University, but I did not imagine a campus like this. So uh, I'm here to talk about Baroque music from the Jesuit missions among the Chiquita and Moho ethnic groups. As a matter of fact, I want to say also uh, thank you to Elizabeth and to Isabel for helping me to come here and to share my research with you. But until our meeting, uh, the title was, uh, you know, Among the Chiquito and Moho Indians in Bolivia. Until today, they prefer to be called no natives, but Indians. That's the context of my work. And I know about problems of this in anthropology and other studies, but that's the way it is. I was of, uh, 60 uh, years of age when my parents presented me, you know, to the competition to be a member of a famous boy choir in Poland. And I was admitted to study music as early as uh, when I was only six. And then I studied music in Poland, in Europe, finally in the United States, and I would never imagine that finally I would turn into musicology and study music from the former Jesuit reductions. It is completely new and surprising for me. I was a jazz musician, I studied Gregorian chant, uh, I was a member of a famous choir, and I studied in Europe in many countries and also in the United States. But when we studied the history of music, never or near to never, they would talk about Renaissance music or Baroque music in America. I'm a European product, and it was completely new to me when in 19... In 81, I was sent to the missions in Paraguay, and I, for the first time, I could see the architecture, the museum, but the music was lacking. In 86, a famous, and I really recommend it to those who have never seen this movie, the movie was released, The Mission, with Robert De Niro, and the soundtrack was composed by Ennio Morricone, who died two or three years ago, a famous composer, a lovely track, but it was not authentic music. They've been looking for authentic music, 
but it was only in 81 when I, when I moved to Paraguay, uh, to, to Bolivia, and we studied a systematic research on music from the former Jesuit reductions. And suddenly I feel like we have to rewrite the history of music of the West, because America was not included. Bolivia seems to have the biggest collection of historic music in Latin America. And when I talk about Bolivia, uh, not only that we have this music, but we can divide this into different categories. We have music brought from Europe by conquerors, by musicians, and by the missionaries. We have music created in America by composers born in Europe, but active in America. 17th century America is so famous, especially music and the Jesuit reductions and Franciscan reductions, that many leave Europe believing that in America they will have a better chance, and it was really true, to reach more than could be reached in Europe. We have music composed by those from the Spaniard families or European families, but born already in America, Criollos. We have music written, baroque music written by natives or Indians, and we have music written by missionaries. The third category, we have music from the from uh, Spanish cathedrals in Spanish America. And this music is quite different from music from the missions. It sounds like music in Spain. Not so music from the missions. The fourth category would be music from the convents. Uh, we've been talking today over the lunch that if we want to discuss the role of women in America in the field of music, 17th, 18th century, where would we go? We did not have mixed choir on orchestras, but go to female contents, and they would produce even operas, cantatas, and everything else. But I'm here to talk about music from the missions, which was preserved, was present everywhere. Now, there is some music from the former Jesuit reductions in California, yeah, but this is Franciscan context. But from the Jesuit missions, it is only it is only Bolivia. Yes, if I know that my voice is a little bit soft, but if you could increase maybe a little bit the volume. And music was preserved in Bolivia in Chiquitos, Mojos, but also Guarani and other ethnic groups. Finally, we have Afro-American music and tradition, and the last group, which is also present, we have a autochthonous music, which is still very much alive. Fragment of music printed in Europe and brought to the missions, you can appreciate here. Well, if you have my studies, which started like 40 years ago, even if I have a note like this, I could tell you quite a bit about the musical tradition uh, on the basis of this document. Um, music played the central role in the project uh, to convert Indians or autochthonous people to the new religion. Should you go with me to the Chiquito archives when we have the biggest collection of Baroque music from the missions, I would take you to the room and place on your one side music, and on the other side, the books of baptism. And it was surprising for me to realize that when the new religion was pre uh, preached, the conversion was not very frequent, because the locals had faith, religion, even notion of commandments, not ten, but you know, even a major sin for 
many of the communities would be to be lazy. It was a sin for the local people. So to come with a new religion was like to offer, well, don't speak English, but speak Polish or speak Spanish or things like this. Why to convert? And I could not establish when and who has done this, but suddenly, instead of talking about God, we started with solemn liturgies. We started with beautifully built churches and things like this. And you see the way the repertoire grows and the number of converted to the new religion goes in parallel. To show you the context, in the middle of the jungle, it took months to get to places like this, but churches were built of this beauty. And when we talk about the Jesuit reduction, what, what is the meaning of this? Well, the reduction is a newly formed community where you would have three to 5,000 natives or Indians, and only two or three European missionaries. Spaniards were not allowed to live in the reductions. It was David Bloch who in 1990 anthropologist, but also historian, who said, well, perhaps our interpretation of the history is not correct, because we consider this as a Jesuit reduction. How about if we call it Chiquito, Guarani, Moho reductions? Because it is true that the inspiration and the model comes from Europe, but the job was achieved by the locals, and you can find in it, like in music, many local influences. Among the Chiquito uh, population uh, or society, 10 churches like this were built and also furnished with paintings, sculptures, and musical instruments. What was preserved in Bolivia is not just the music but also musical instruments, and even more. Bolivia is the only place on earth where Baroque music never disappeared. They would admit new music, but never drop the Baroque music from the time of the first evangelization. The instrument that you can see is an organ built by the locals. Missionaries would bring a design but building the musical instruments, they would use local materials. So even if you, we have to admit that design is not so different from what we have in Europe, the sound would be already different because the material, they would be different. Let us hear the first musical example. All the examples that I'm using for this presentation, it is music from Bolivia, and an in interpretation of our artists. And music come from, the, from my studies, from the, music, from the mission archives. Uh, let us hear a short example of music written, composed in the missions for this instrument. <laughs>
it sounds like music from Europe, absolutely from Italy, and it could be by Sipoli. And uh, but again, when we talk about missions in Latin America and the end of the 17th century, to have instruments built like this and locals playing this, this is a big, big advance. This instrument that we see was built after the expulsion of the Jesuits. And, and uh, in the Bolivian jungle context, these instruments, like violins, cellos, are built even today. Baroque instruments, not the modern ones. They built also violins, harps, flutes, and all the instruments known in the 18th century Europe. So in a sense, the musical practice in the missions would exceed in richness a European practice because practicing a new Baroque music in the missions would not necessarily mean that the autochthonous music would disappear. I'm talking to you in English with the Polish accent, obviously, yeah. Um, but I'm still Polish. In culture, in music, we could be bilingual, or we could speak even more than two musical styles. And uh, let us hear a short Baroque sonata that was brought from Europe, probably, uh, that, that's for sure, from Europe, probably from Italy to the missions, and uh, uh, interpreted by the locals. by Balbi, but the attitude of the locals towards the music brought from Europe was not passive. When the music of European tradition came to the missions, they would take this music into their hands and say, well, we like it, but we could make it better. And they would rewrite, recompose the music. Music is different from architecture from painting and rather art, because uh, uh, someone who is singing, playing Baroque music, is in a part a composer of this. We never play the same piece twice, exactly the same. The audience, the environment is an inspiration 
to be also creative. And usually, because they have a new mentality, they suppress the number of a composer, the title of the piece, because in the mission, it was important, more important to praise God. This is mostly sacred music, seldom ever non-sacred music. To praise God and also to elevate our thoughts toward, toward heaven and not who is a composer or what is the title of this music. So for musicology, this is quite a challenge today established what came from Europe and the way it was treated in the missions. I have established in my studies uh, music by uh, an Italian composer, uh, Giovanni Battista Bassani, the way original Bassani sounds and the way Bassani uh, from the missions. He never traveled to Latin America, but because they had their own tradition and own taste for music, music that traveled to Latin America would be, uh, would be different. Yeah, uh, in the recent, uh, the recent discovery of a 3,100 folios, which is double for, of music. The sonata which we have heard, we have over 140 Baroque sonatas, over 100 concertos, for a small Baroque orchestra. In Chiquitos, we have almost 6,000 pages of Baroque music, and it was never included in the history books. So we just, we just cannot ignore this, and, and we just have to rewrite this, uh, the, the history of music. In the Mopos, we had 7,200 pages of music everything copied by the locals. The last Baroque copy of music in Mohos, which is Bolivian Amazonic uh, rainforest zone, it was copied, Baroque music, without any interruption in 2005. In 2005, in one of the expeditions that I participated in, we have made a Xerox copy to take the original and to provide, you know, this music, the original, uh, to protect this and restore in the well-equipped uh, archives that today we have in the Bolivian Rainforest Zone. And, then, and I leave a Xerox copy. A year later, I visit these communities, and I see a very strange behavior. From a Xerox copy, they had a make a handmade copy. And I'm asking, why are you doing this? I can give you 10, 20 copies if you want. They say, no, this is a sacred music. How to praise God with a zero's copy? We have lost this. We have, and we have to teach this also in musicology and in art. We go, you know, to this conservatory of music, and I'm in charge of our 30 music schools in the rainforest zone. And we can learn also about the sacredness of this music and the musical style and so many other things. It's a lovely Cornell University. I have studied at the Catholic University in Washington, D.C. But you go to the rainforest zone, and they are smart, they have philosophy, and they have appreciation that we cannot find in ourselves. So a huge, huge collections of music. And we have not only collection of music, but we can, and we need to study in musicology about musical practice. Once a year, from every mission, they would send a narrative, a description of musical practice Today, we've been discussing over lunch, you know, the musical practice in 17th century, 18th century China. We don't have much music, but we can really uh, come much closer to, uh, to, to what it really was when you read these reports. You go to Rome and you have tons of documentation with a description 
of the understanding of music, building of musical instruments, and you have it like here, music and description. Everything done, everything done by the locals. Missionaries were too busy with preaching, confessions, adorations. They had no time for this. And the office of copist, as I have told you, in the Bolivian rainforest on Amazonian zone, even in 2005, they copy music by hand. Uh, so from the Chiquito, we have 731 titles, but one title could be an opera. So lots of music. From Mojos, we have uh, 1,154 titles. Altogether, we have 1,885 titles of music from the, from the Jesuit reductions. So it must be included in the history books uh, otherwise. And there is lots of music uh, in, in the other archives. My time is much too short. I want to show you some of this music copied by hand. If you read this with me, it is 8 Junio 1918, Manuel Trinidad Mosova. The beginning of the 20th century, you see this handwriting, which is almost perfect, and it was written on pentagramma, Baroque notation, and uh, and uh, is the confessor, which is like uh, in Latin a hymn for vespers, for vespers. So it is, if you have copies like this, you don't need to transcribe this music. You could use, you know, an original, and we have it. But more often, it looks like this. But again, uh, it is possible, it is possible, if we could reduce maybe this light, it would be easier. Um, uh, this is also made. Uh, quite often, again, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, copies. And again, it is 24 September 1859. Thank you, yes, it helps. It helps. Yeah, and uh, this is, you have here Magnificat. You have he here indication that this is music for the Vespers. And if you have my experience, almost 40 years in this, it was already reconstructed. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have a fragment like this, but I have written the catalog of this music, and believe me that it is possible to to discover, to, to locate this in the whole of the collection. Let us try. Well, this is not a vocal, this is not soprano, bass part, there is no text. Yeah, but it looks like one of the uh, instruments, could be violin. If this is violin, we don't see the clef, but probably this would be a G clef, because a violin part in the 17th, 18th century would use the E clef. And you see, we would read fa fa mi mi re re do do re re do do si si da la, and so and so on. And I was trying to discover what would be part of the. the and suddenly, I see that I'm mistaken because what was fa fa mi mi re re do do, if I turn this, you know, the opposite side, it's going to be do do si si da la sol so. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's amazing, you know, and, and very exciting to do this. It takes time, it takes time, but uh, yeah. Uh, here it's even more important, uh, complicated, because we really don't know if this is an F clef or if it's G or whatever. Sometimes music was copied, you know, in the, the end of the 20th century like this. The oldest manuscript, from the Moho and Chiquito that survive looks like this. They still dress in a very traditional way. They still mix, you know, uh, 
in one musical production, the autochthonous music, Baroque music, and post-Baroque music. Rome still is so far away that in our liturgies, they feel quite free, and they keep this tradition from the past. Uh, we've been discussing over the lunch also how, where to look for uh, autochthonous music if you have mostly a Baroque production. Well, if you go to the formal mass, don't expect that the Latin mass in the 18th century in the missions would lose, uh, use local lang languages or, or non uh, European and not all of the European tradition instruments because the liturgy was a subject regulated by the liturgical law. So mass in Rome in the missions was more or less similar. But when you leave the church and go to Corpus Christi procession, then was the context to apply autochthonous music and to mix violins with flutes of their own tradition to introduce percussion instruments and all the rest. In Bolivia, it is still very much alive. And music for the choir, some of the music that travel from Europe to Latin America later on gets lost in Europe, and we can reconstruct this from American context. So even rewriting the history of music in America, sometimes we better understand ourselves, we who were born and created in Europe. Let us, let us maybe, no, sorry, I want to play this. Uh, yeah, this is, this is, uh, <laughs> And I have reconstructed opera, entire opera with text in the Chiquitano language. Here I want to present a lamentation, lamentation written in the missions, the text in Moho language. Listen to this beauty. <laughs>
to play the whole ecosystem example. I still want to show you a little bit more. Well, we understand Santissimo Sacramento of Jesucristo because this is new. But the entire text is a local language. And we, when we talk about lamentations, we think about Jeremiah. When you go to the missions, the Jeremiah is a reference, but the locals would rewrite the lamentations, adding some of their own impressions and piety. Something similar would happen with, with the music. Uh, let us see today uh, the musical ensemble that you see. If you want to get to this place, to this music school, they never had any opportunity to work with teachers from Europe or from the United States or North America. This is the continuity of the tradition implemented in the 18th century uh, musical, uh, uh, Jesuit reductions. Listen to this performance. Uh, this is the Indian blood community, the native. <laughs> of the Bolivian rainforest zone is not about the past. This is still alive and to my knowledge this is the only place on earth where experience like this could be our experience. So it is absolutely unbelievable. This very place which is Urubicha and I'm working, I've been there a week ago, 10 days ago. Um, the population is more or less 6,000 inhabitants, the music school has 637 students. If you don't have a musical ear in this, well, you are, uh, uh, they notice you that you are like not from this place. And, and well, it's, it's Cornell University, but I, I have to tell you this. If you are a girl and you don't have a musical ear, on Saturday, you have to go to the river and do laundry. But if you are a musician, you go to the music school for rehearsal. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's totally amazing for us. And this is what I want to use the next example. Uh, this is a music by an Italian composer, Giovanni Battista Bassani. <coughs> Six masses by this composer were brought, I don't know by whom, to, to the missions. And here you have Misa Encarnacion V. This is a soprano part, baroque rotation. This is the violin part, and I have reconstructed this. And then years later, I travel uh, to Zurich, and I discovered who was really the composer of this music. And it shows us the behavior of the local musicians when the new music arrived from Europe. They never, never wanted to be imitators of the musical practice from Europe. They liked or disliked some of this music, some of the moments of this music, but they would always rewrite this music, making this music of their own. And listen to the polyphonic mass. This is more or less 1740. In every place, they would have 30 to 40 professional musicians playing and singing polyphonic mass every single day of the week. Knowing this, I am convinced that the musical practice the, between 1720 1760 in America is much more developed than in Europe. No one in Europe in this period of time could pay 30 to 40 professional music musicians. In the missions, it was the practice. Please listen with me this, uh, this performance. Where I have it? Yeah. The polyphonic mass. We have 96 polyphonic masses that some more or less, more or less like this one I'm going to play it.
individuals, you have twice as much, maybe more. Yeah, and uh, I just have to finish, if I could, uh, two or three minutes more. And um, the interpretation by the local musicians. And to end this, uh, let me uh, present you this choir, which is Arakaenda Choir. Arakaenda, this is a word in Guarayo language. It means historic, ancient, history. Yeah? And they have chosen this uh, for the name of the choir, and it is conducted by um, Dominique Vellard, 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 a French musician, and musicologists. Today, many leading musicians in the field of historic music write to Bolivia and say, well, could we come and sing music from the Bolivian archives and work with the locals to, to learn something new? Because our interpretation and our understanding of the music is right, but we want to enrich this by having you know, a common experience with the Bolivian artist. Listen please, as this is the, the, the last example of this choir. <laughs> Century. In 91, when I start my systematic studies of this collection, this manuscript is known to six to, uh, six to eight people. In 30 years, we have been to Wigmore Hall, we've been to the Kennedy Center, we've been to Japan, South Africa, all over America and Europe. So I thank you very much for giving me a chance and I cordially invite you, the next year we have the uh, number 14 festival of Baroque music, uh, Renaissance of Baroque music in Latin America, in, in Bolivia. Uh, please visit Bolivia during the time of our festival. 
We have also, you know, this symposium. We share, you know, papers between historians, theater people, and, and musicologists. Thank you very, very much. And now I'm open to, well, if I could answer any questions if you had. Thank you very much. questions now for you. Can you get the lights in the back, please? So I can start us off, actually. I wonder if you would tell us a little bit more about your first researches in Bolivia and um, your interaction with the local community there, how your identity as a Catholic priest may have influenced um, or been part of those uh, interactions with the local communities and um, and working with them and collaborating them with with these manuscripts and music. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, when in '91 I arrived to, to to Bolivia to the rainforest zone, my trip was really well prepared. I was ordained ten years earlier, so they knew that the Catholic priest and musicologist is coming. This manuscript was never lost. If you go into the Google and read about Piotr Nadrod or Hans Roth, sometimes, and it sounds really good, they inform Piotr Nadrod discovered the manuscript of No. Uh, I did not want, I did not, did not know how to react. This manuscript was never lost. I wanted to have access, like if you go to the library here or the archives, you have to present your ID and present yourself to get the manuscript on the desk. I go to the native communities and they know that I'm a priest and they, you know, the behavior is, it, it was new to me. They first wanted to have a meeting with me and the admission lasted for five hours. To be allowed to see this, to study this, they wanted to know about my faith. They, knew, they wanted to know how much I know about this tradition. They know, wanted to know why I have interest in this. They wanted to know what I'm going to do with this. No one ever gave me such a philosophy lesson like what I have learned in the Bolivian Rainforest Zone. And at the end, when finally I got a verdict, you can, and the verdict sounds like this. Well, such a good thing that you are coming here, because if this gets lost, we all will lose our reason or our ident identification. It was not just the music of the locals. It was like having faith, like having, you know, university training to go and to find yourself in your life. Because of this, maybe uh, in the 20th century, 21st century, when new communities were founded in the Bolivian Rainforest Zone, they go to the original place and they copy this music. So it is to gain the trust, to go with this attitude, I'm not coming here as a teacher, I'm not going here to dominate, but I want to live a moment, to experience something with you, you know? And my attitude is, was really to, to, to understand, to learn, and not to teach. And after, uh, afterwards, I traveled to the Catholic U, I finished my doctoral degree, and I knew Rome wanted me to go back to, 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 to Europe and to teach in Europe. But I said no, because, you know, the, having such a privilege to be the first one to have this experience, it was about loyalty, to go back and to keep my life in service to this community. This is my experience. Yes, please. Um, I, thank you, that was just absolutely fascinating. It's an area I know nothing about, and I'm delighted to learn. 
But I wanted to ask you, I'm a little um, unsure of the, you said that manuscript was never lost. Does that mean it was being performed? Because you also said you had to reconstruct it. So I'm wondering what your role was in making this music performable, or was it already for the centuries before, since the 18th century when it was written down, still perform, performed and performable? You know, uh, only recently, maybe two years ago, that asphalt road was built, you know, to get to some of the places, but it was a very distant place. The manuscript was lost to us, born in North America, in Europe, in my case, and we studied the history of music the way we have studied. But the Indians did not uh, erase this tradition after the expulsion of the missionaries from the territory. They kept this even to such an extent that when at the beginning of the one of the communities uh, there is a persecution of the of the natives uh, there is a problem of taking men from the community and sending to have a cheap labor to a different places there is an insurrection in one of the missions and the government reacts and sends soldiers. They have only a few moments to escape deeper into the jungle to protect women and children. And this is amazing behavior. They leave everything, but they take music and musical instruments. Well, it is like, you know, Israel and Arka of Noe you know, going through the desert for 40 years, but this gives them strength, meaning, and more. So it was lost for us, not for them. And they, even when they, 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 they copy the second half of the 20th century, is not so exact, but it is 250 years. The missionary would visit the place twice a year, once a year, and they copy text in Latin, and they still remember the meaning of Latin. So they have to be given credit to preserve this music. And when I say that I have restored some of this, well, quite often, if you see the final product reconstructed, in the archives, I could get 40%, 60%, 70%, and whatever is missing, I have to compose to make it possible to perform this. And the performance must be first included into the religious service. When we have a Baroque music festival in Bolivia, it lasts for 10 days, we have two weekends. One of the weekends, uh, we organize concerts, but one of the weekends on Sunday, we sing 20 to 24 Baroque messes to go back to the original. And you know, we have international music ensembles, and they come to perform in the context of concert, but they want to go to the religious service too. It is possible to, to achieve it in the 21st century. So they never lost this, never. But we did not know that it was still preserved by the local communities. Yes, please. Um, I was very interested to see the, and hear the organ that you showed. Are there other historic organs in Bolivia? And can you say a little bit more about the um, traditions of organ building and the degree to which the organ building knowledge has continued and instruments have been maintained even away from a kind of Western I imagine that you know about the organs in Oaxaca, Mex yeah. in Mexico. Yeah. Yes, yes, because that's the biggest collection. In Bolivia, in the tropical rainforest, in every church you, do, you would have one, two, or quite often three organs. In addition, you would have also positive organs of different sizes. You know, they would be used in processions and things like this. But the tropical zone was very severe, you know, for wood, and not much was preserved. But in the Andes, we have over 40 historic organs, some of them still in use. All of them built in Bolivia. Uh, they had at least two different traditions of building those instruments. And we have, 
We have even today in Bolivia a young man building positive organs of a very good quality, selling those instruments not only in Bolivia, but also Chile, Paraguay, Argentina, um, and, and, and few other countries. Yeah, not many instruments in the tropical zone survived, but this one was built after the explosion of the of the Jesuits. Uh, again, we have detailed descriptions the way the building of this instrument was taught to the Indians. Yeah, yeah, we have it, we have it. And Franciscans were very active in this too. But instrument itself in the tropical zone, only one. Uh, but the literature for organ is quite extensive. Really? Yeah, it's quite extensive. Yes, do I have two questions? Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure I understand. I have no background in this. I've been Catholic for my whole life, more than 80 years. And you made me realize the richness of my life has had so much to do with the music. Um, I don't understand when the Jesuits came to Bolivia, when they were kicked out, and how the music continues, and how the non professional people can sing in a choir like <laughs> We've been discussing over lunch, you know, uh, if this music was imposed or it was proposed. My answer is the second. Because the Jesuits started, you know, this project in what is today Bolivia in 1681 in Mojos and 1691 in Chiquitos. The expulsion of the Jesuits I mean, uh, comes in 1767-68. The missions are left without priests. Later on, some of the missions would have a priest, but not, not quite often. Uh, but again, this music was considered as their own music. As I have referred in my presentation, even if you would have music coming from Europe, you know, their mentality and their attitude was not, well, we want to sing so nicely like in Venice or in Rome or in Madrid. No. Some of this music they enjoyed and they repeated more or less the same. But a lot of this mu music was recomposed and it was kept consciously, because it was considered this is our own music. They are very offended when some of the musicologists or artists come and they say, this is Italian music. No, they say, no, this is our music. It sounds Italian, and the origin of this music could be Italian. But it was adopted and transformed by us. It's more or less, it's not Comparison is always, you know, uh, not exactly the same. Like taking, you know, a popular song and writing a symphony. You are still a composer, even if the melody and the rhythm, and sometimes even harmony, original, it was already written. Yeah. So this is my reading of well, of what happened. And no priest, no nun, should be credited with what is going on, or was going on, and still is going on, in this context, context that I have presented here. Yes, please. You mentioned a lot of, like, just technological, industrial. I can hear you. Sorry. You mentioned a lot of, like, technological, industrial changes to the area, um, like electricity coming in or a road being built. Um, sort of prior to that, it seems like this musical and manuscript um, tradition opened up. Um, like, how has that affected the community? Like, the, this music being shared throughout the world, how has that affected the community? In yeah, well, that, that, that's, that's amazing. Let me answer this way. When we have our festival of international musicians, 
really appreciate is that when they go, they have to get one concert in the major city in Santa Cruz, but then they have to go to the missions, the local communities, and play this music for the locals. And mostly, you have the local musicians. And several times I asked the locals, how did you like this presentation? I cannot refer you the name of the musical ensemble <laughs> because of obvious reason. And they say, well, we like this, but they did not play our music. And I said, no, they played your music. I have reconstructed this, and I have put this on the program of the festival. No, this is not our music. Why? Because they play it as a concert music. It's not spiritual anymore. You see, the, this ingredient, when we teach Baroque music, we teach ornamentation, we, need, we teach basso continuo, we teach the tuning, we teach you know, the instrument, different bow, different you know, strings, and things like this. But we don't teach anymore the spiritual approach to this. And, 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 and this is what makes also a difference. This is a danger right now, internet, electricity, Oswald Road, but most of the time what I see is they admit a new one, but keep the old one still very much alive. And when they sing Baroque Mass, they say, this is our Mass. When they sing, sing a new one, and quite often, really well, well, we like it, but this is not ours. I think we have time for one more question, uh, Josh. I really love you just said about maintaining the spirit of the music. But can you identify any specific harmonic or rhythmic ideas that are consistent in the Bolivian music? If, if I can identify. Any consistency in rhythmic or motivic structures that, that we could say is from Bolivia? Um, I had 45 minutes, uh, <laughs> and I have this, I have this, you know, I identified when uh, some of the local music becomes a rock music. Yeah, there is, and it is not just the case of Bolivia. Stevenson, I have written my doctoral dissertation with Stevenson. He was the first one to call our attention to this, that even if the autochthonous music was different, it was not so much different that it could not be codified in our system. You know, the rhythm, the melody. The musical scale could be different, but there, is, there was also some similarity. And much, a, a, a good number of this local music was notified, and it was until the middle of the 20th century in some of the archives in Mexico. But it disappeared. It disappeared, yeah. Uh, so uh, I did not have a chance to show you this, but maybe if you if you navigate in uh, in Google, you can find my article that in part would answer this uh, this question. And maybe let me end this way. Uh, we didn't know what, how to behave with newly converted to Catholicism because we wanted to ordain as soon as possible, but we had some um, painful experience with three priests ordained in the 16th century. Not only did they left the priesthood, but they went back to the, to the original uh, religions. And it was in part, in part, a justification probably not to ordain, you know, the natives until the, the end of the 17th century. They studied philosophy and theology. They could have different offices in the cathedrals and the missions, and things, but they did not ordain. It seems like Hanak Pacha Kusikuni, 
the famous piece in, Chiquit, in, in, in uh, Quechua language, the polyphony, lovely from the Cusco Cathedral, that it was composed when finally someone from the Quechua was ordained to the priesthood. Um, but music is nothing to do, uh, you know, with the uh, autochthonous music, but the text is an original language. So it is complex, because the music, especially vocal music, is not just the rhythm, harmony, and musical scale, also text and also interpretation. But the Indian, and I really prefer call to apply this in the end because I live in such a contact context that if I give this presentation in the Bolivian rainforest zone they would say, well, don't call us natives because you know we suffer another change. We are, when we when you apply native, well this is not our original name either. You know, so you see uh, probably we have to sit down at the table but invite also the locals and, and invite them to speak and, and then we will have it right or we'll be closer to the right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Please join um, me in thanking Professor Narvut again. You can continue from, uh, these conversations at a reception in the back of the auditorium. Um, just a couple of announcements before you all head back. Um, first, Lycola's Institute will be hosting a panel event on um, science, religion, and the environment on Friday, April 22nd, here in this room. Um, it'll be a fun event. We have two theologians, a scientist. One of the panelists is actually a Cornell alumnus who's now a theologian, so that's kind of cool. And then the following day, the, um, the panel guests will be offering a workshop for graduate students and seniors, um, any and all grad and professional students and seniors are welcome to join. And there uh, is information on the table at the back on those events. Um, secondly, at the reception, you can find some information about one of the organizations um, Father Narvat is involved with that supports Bolivian cultural heritage. Um, that's the Asociación Pro Arte y Cultura, uh, which is a nonprofit supporting cultural heritage. Um, its mission is to revive, preserve, and promote the cultural patrimony of Eastern Bolivia. Uh, Father Nervert was so kind as to offer this presentation without any honorarium. It was so generous of him. Um, so I'd like to encourage you, if you uh, feel so moved, um, to donate to this uh, organization. Um, there's a QR code on the back. If you prefer Venmo, um, Professor Isabel uh, Purr will also be accepting donations through her Venmo, and then she'll um, put that all in, in one chunk. Okay, so please join us in the back, and thank you once again.